Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I am excited to have Alonzo Felix with us here today and I realize that I have I always forget to click on myself. Sorry about that. Um, so Alonzo Felix is here today with us. I'm really excited to have him. We I saw him and met him at Creative South where I met a lot of people. Um, <laughs> And I mean, he has a ton of great energy. And what I think is going to be really fascinating for y'all is that he, you know, great illustrator, and then he studied typography, and now he's doing something even different. So I really like how he just kind of goes with the flow and goes where his interests are leading him. And I hope that inspires y'all to do some of the same things. So thanks, everybody, for coming live. And I'm going to get Alonzo up. And if you could tell us a little bit about your background and where your interest for design and illustration started, and then we'll get into the typography stuff. So, hello, Internet. Hi, Diane. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, and thanks to everybody watching. So, I'm Alonzo Felix, as Diane said, a graphic designer now based in New York City, but originally from Louisiana, the last place I lived in Louisiana. Before I moved to New York was Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the capital city. Um, and I guess my interest in art and design started really young probably the same for a lot of creative people. Um, I did a lot of drawing growing up, middle school, high school. I took, I went to this sort of like magnet school for performing arts and visual arts uh, in high school and took a bunch of art classes, um, as many as there were available. I sort of took them all and um, did a little bit of work in ceramics and uh, did paintings and drawings and, you know, tried all media, pastel, pencil drawings, uh, life drawing, all kinds of stuff. So I was definitely interested in art, and I was good at drawing, um, but I didn't even know what graphic design was, hadn't heard of it, uh, until I graduated high school and was looking around uh, at college. I, I started in business um, <laughs> at Louisiana State University, actually, um, and then ended up switching to graphic design, I think, uh, halfway through my first semester or something like that. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, which was fine, because at that point, you're still sort of taking uh, you know, prerequisite courses, like... You're not really getting anything good in your right. major just yet, just taking like general requirements. So it was totally fine to switch then. Um, so I did that and was inspired to do it from a graphic design professor that I met who had seen some of my drawings and um, thought I should try graphic design and sort of explained to me what it was. And I took like the intro to graphic design class. I think there was only one that you could take at LSU prior to like going through the portfolio review process mm -hmm. and getting accepted to the program. Um, they would take, like, I think 25 or 30 students a year or something like that. So um, ended up uh, applying and getting in the first time I tried in LSU's graphic design program, which was really good. Um, so that's where it kind of all started, I guess. So LSU, so, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask you because I went to Auburn. So <laughs> I, um, it's a big SEC school. So did you just choose LSU... Uh, I mean, based on business, or did you just because you needed to stay in state, or what? Yeah, it was mostly just based on money, honestly. Um, I was looking at Savannah College of Art and Design and some other schools um, that were interested, but I think it just came down to money for me, um, just trying to keep it as cheap as possible <laughs> um, yeah. for undergrad. So I went to LSU for free, basically, as a result of, like, grants and uh, scholarships and things like that, so... I really was uh, one, of, one of the lucky few who was able to graduate from college with no debt. So, that's, yeah, that's yeah, that set me up really nicely. <laughs> that's awesome, and it doesn't hurt to go. It's a big, good school, and uh, Levi's saying go Gators, but I, you know, definitely not going to say that. Growing up a Georgia fan, so I I'm not allowed to say that, <laughs> and almost saying that too. And Jason had something funny. He said, "Did um." Creative South inspire your beard. Yeah, I was just responding. I'm just I'm getting ready for the the <laughs> fall and winter in New York, so I'm gonna keep it nice and warm this winter. <laughs> well, good good for you. I'm gonna try to read as I, as I go, and hopefully we'll get all the questions if there are any over there. All right, so because um, we're down here in the deep south, and it's definitely not oh, cold at all. Um, I remember it well. <laughs> right, it's a little sticky still, but okay, so you had this interest in typography, and then you went and studied in London for the summer, I think it was the summer maybe after you graduated, um, and then you studied for, I believe, a year at the Cooper Union in New York, and 
you studied typography there. So do you think that you would have had gone and studied at the Cooper Union if you hadn't done that summer in London? Um, I think the answer is yes, because I actually it's just kind of a matter of, uh, of just the dates, just the way it happened. But um, I think I found out about the Cooper program before the one in London and applied to that one before the one in London. Um, so just kind of the way it worked out. But I was definitely interested to do something different. And actually, the summer in London came uh, two years after I graduated in graphic design. So I graduated in 2009 from LSU with my undergraduate degree in art history and graphic design. Um, and then I was working in a print shop in Baton Rouge for two years after that, which is kind of an interesting story. I worked for the Louisiana District Attorneys Association, which sounds really like fancy and fun. So I got to like, rub elbows with lawyers and stuff all the time and lobbyists and that sort of thing. Um, but they had an in-house print shop because they put on conferences for district attorneys all over the state. Um, and like events and, and those kinds of things, workshops. So they needed print material for all of those, and I got to kind of do all that stuff, which is fun. And we also did uh, the law enforcement handbook, which was like this little handbook Louisiana State Troopers would carry around like in their police cars and that kind of thing. That was like written by the lawyers at the District Attorneys Association, uh, and they would just you know refer to it just in case they had any questions about procedure and that kind of thing. So. That was another fun little thing I got to, to print while I was there. But um, So that lasted uh, a couple of years while I was in school. I was sort of interning in the print shop, and then I ran it full time for two years after school, just like saving money and getting ready to make the next move. So when 2011 came around, I was ready to make like, a move. I had saved enough money to, to find a job somewhere outside of Louisiana and kind of like move into the next phase of my career. So. I found out about the uh, the Cooper Type program on Twitter, actually, just from some designers I was following. So that's cool. So, yeah. do you think? I mean, I have a a friend who is a designer, and he says, you know, if he could have done uh, something from the get go, he would have. If he was telling his younger self, he would have worked at a print shop because there's so much stuff that you learn that you don't learn in school, and it, he just said that it was so valuable. He felt like when he was starting his own company, if had he had that um, right. information in his brain, he would have been able to make better choices. So, do you think that that's really impacted you as a designer? Um, well, definitely having like a background in print production helps if you're a graphic designer. <laughs> like I ran offset presses and digital presses, so I kind of had experience with both which is really cool, and uh, the, the offset presses at least were super old, so they were always breaking down, which means I had to fix printing presses all the time, which was really good experience. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely say that the sort of like print production experience, knowing how to set jobs up for print and that kind of thing definitely is, is helpful. Well, cool. All right, so back to the questions um, that I sent you. Um, so how do you think the experience at the Cooper Union really shaped you as um, as a designer and a typographer and just as a, a business person, maybe? Yeah, so I sort of had a, a generalized design education, as it is at a lot of, sort of liberal arts schools. Right. So the idea of focusing in one area was really appealing to me. Um, and I was just really curious about the way that I learned at college type typography can sort of make or break a project. Um, so I wanted to focus on typography specifically. Like if you think about um, just like websites or billboards or print advertisements, just try to imagine those things without any words, like just the images. Like you just have to realize how big a role typography plays and how big a role just words in general play in visual society and sort of in communication. Um, so I just wanted to kind of focus on that area specifically just to get better at type. I mean, and also there's like a, there's a specialized lingo with every profession, right? Whether it's dentist, dentistry or like physics or whatever it is. Um, and so I kind of wanted to learn the specialized language of, of typography. And so the Cooper Union experience was really, really cool. Um, so it's a, the Cooper Union is a, a private uh, art school in New York City. And it was another, like, one of those situations where I had to apply and hopefully get in. And if I didn't get in, I had to apply the next year and, like, you know, wait a whole year in between, that kind of thing. Um, but the program is fantastic. Um, there are workshops and, of course, classes and 
the whole focus is on typeface design specifically. So you're learning like how to draw typefaces professionally, and all the work goes into that. So working with Font Lab or RoboFont, um, and sort of like learning that specialized software for designing typefaces. Um, and then the sort of in-class uh, ed education and lessons that you get are supplemented by workshops on weekends and lectures and things like that. Um, from like Ken Barber from House Industries did a, a lettering workshop, for example. Um, Karen Sheraton would do calligraphy workshops. Um, and some of the public lectures included like Sumner Stone. There were three terms to the program, so three terms in one year. Um, and the end of each term, uh, our work would be reviewed by professional typeface designers. So like. Um, I think uh, uh, Chester Jenkins from Village came over and helped with the critique. Um, Christian Schwartz from Commercial Type was another. So it was really great to get like feedback from actual working, you know, professional typeface designers who do this for a living. Yeah. yeah. So Jason, oops, I forget to click on myself. Um, Jason has a question. How do you feel about the Cooper Union trying to charge students now? Well, that's kind of an unfortunate situation. Um, from what I understand, there was just a lot of mismanagement by the board and some miscommunication to um, alumni and things like that about what the actual financial situations and the, the money situation was with the school. Um, so they were in worse financial shape than it appeared. Um, so it's just kind of an unfortunate necessity, I think, in some ways. There were certainly protests and there were movements um, I think there was even a group that boycotted the uh, sort of president of Cooper Union's office and like set up camp in his office. He couldn't go in there and work, and they had people bringing them food. Wow. And stuff. Yeah, it was it was really. <laughs> intense. Um, and there were a couple of different groups that like proposed solutions and ways to maybe um, address the issue and not have to charge tuition, because one of the one of the important things about the Cooper Union as an institution is just that. Since its inception over 100 years ago, they never charged tuition for undergraduate students. Um, There's always sort of like an endowment uh, and that kind of thing. But you were able to go there and get you know this super elite education in art and uh, in engineering and design uh, for free as an undergraduate. So that was just like a major part of what the school was known for, I guess. Right. And so it's really unfortunate that. Um, you know, things didn't work out, and they weren't able to avoid charging. You know. yeah. yeah, it is a bummer. But yeah. um, there's so much stuff that you can learn from being in an intensive kind of environment with other people that are really passionate about what you're you're learning. Um, especially if you didn't feel like you really had um, a focus beforehand. I think that. Right. Studying with other people who are also so focused really makes you, uh, I don't know, you realize all the stuff you don't know, and then you can just really dig deep. And I think that when you dig deep, and you really talk about this at Creative South, you talked about it um, at um, WMC Fest, I watched a Vimeo of your uh, um, talk there. You really dig deep into a lot of things, and I think that that's been maybe one of the reasons you've been able to be so successful is that you don't just um, say, hey, this is what I do, and you just fit into this one thing. You've really reinvented yourself a few times already, and I think that you kind of embrace that um, idea of reinventing yourself, and I don't know if you think of yourself like that, but as I watch and as I heard, that was what I was like, wow, he's able to do this and like go and I'm going to make Shauna happy, balls to the wall, because I said that one time, she's like, you should say that more, so I'm saying it for you now today, Shauna. Um, but you just, you really kind of just take it instead of like having it, like, oh, this isn't me, or I can't do this, or whatever. But do you feel like you have really reinvented yourself? I do, definitely. I started, as I said, drawing by hand, um, and then sort of moved into, around the time I graduated from undergrad, lettering and illustration. Um, and then I sort of focused on typeface design for a couple of years, and then I worked, um, while I was in the school at Cooper, I was working at Oak Studios as an intern. So Oak Studios is a web design and development firm based out of Studio Mates. Um, Studio Mates is a collaborative workspace in Dumbo, Brooklyn, where uh, uh, Tina Roth Eisenberg works out of. Some of you may know as SwissMiss.com. Uh, so that was like a really, really great experience for sure. 
Oh, there we are. Studiomates.com. Posted the link. Yeah, I put the link over there. Or over. I don't know if I'm pointing in the right place. So, <laughs> um, anyway, so how do you feel like? Because um, you really do get stuff from other places, and they really, you really embrace the message, and you. In what I've seen of your stuff, you kind of, um, you know, um, whittle it down to its its most purest form, and then you kind of uh, just relish in that message. It seems like for me, um, how do you get? How do you? How would you tell somebody else to kind of? Or can you give an example of how you go dip deeper into um, whatever your your influences are? Can you? Give us a little background, I guess. Yeah, so I guess um, I've been, like I said, I started with drawing and then lettering, illustration, then did web design uh, for a while, and branding over at Oak Studios, and out on my own, I've been freelancing for the last year or so. Um, I've been doing a lot of web design and development. I've actually gotten into writing a lot of code this year, which has been really fun. Uh, and doing some UI design and that sort of thing. And I think just like all of that taken together um, has been really, really beneficial. Just, I guess I'm just curious naturally. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of want to know how things work. And instead of uh, being a designer who sort of markets himself as being able to do just one thing, uh, I'm sort of interested in having an open practice right now mm -hmm. and uh, being able to tackle a variety of different kinds of work. So I guess that's you, what I'm up to at this point. <laughs> do you think you've always, sorry, do you think you've always been like that? Do you think you've always been, like, um, you'll get into something and then you kind of master it or you get really close, like you learn, a, a, like, coding as a language and then you're able to kind of go from that and, and apply that to something else? Do you feel like that's how you're going to continue growing as a designer? I think so. I mean, all of these different areas are connected. Right, so it's all creativity, and it's all just different ways of communicating a message. Whether you're doing it through um, illustration, or doing it through lettering, or doing it through typeface design, or web design, whatever it is, I think they're all just connected um, and sort of inform each other. And the nice mm -hmm. thing about being able to have some web design skills and being able to write code now um, a bit better, it's just that you can communicate with other people much better. Like you can communicate with web developers in a completely different way if you understand how to write code and understand web languages rather than um, just having a print background. And so I didn't want to be one of those designers. Not that there's anything wrong with just focusing on print. There are lots of people who do and do amazing work, and I really appreciate them. Um, but I just personally wanted to focus more on web stuff this year for sure. I mean, the web is just such a huge part of our lives now, right? Um, just apps and websites in general, there's such a proliferation of them. Um, and so just like understanding the ins and outs of them a lot better was something I was curious about and I'm just happy that I've been able to have the freedom a little bit in my career to kind of explore that stuff and just kind of tackle whatever I want to. That is cool. So um, so you're really doing not just web design but you're really doing interface, user interface. Um, can you talk about how that progression went from were you starting out doing web stuff for clients and then you were realizing that you were wanting to do more apps or just design. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, so whenever I worked at Oak Studios, I worked on a few different apps and got to work on the interfaces for those. Most of my stuff was uh, branding, illustration, and web design, sort of doing web layouts and visual design for things, and then kind of passing things off or handing things off to the developer to work on. Um, but I did touch a little bit of apps, and then I sort of got more and more interested in it, just from uh, uh, being curious about how apps work and kind of moving, kind of taking that next natural progression. So I've done website stuff. Well, what about apps, and what about user interfaces, and how does this all work? And how do you make an, a user interface feel human and feel intuitive and feel friendly and feel easy and natural? You know, there are people doing this work and making amazing apps, how do I do that? How do I learn more about this? So it's just sort of the, na the next nat natural step, I think, for me, from websites to try and figure out the world of apps. And a lot of the work I've done with apps and UI design over the last year or so um, have been like NDA projects, 
for agencies, so I can't really talk about them or like right. show any visuals from them. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely been really fun to get better and better and, and faster, certainly, at um, a user interface design and just figuring out like what feels natural. And um, certainly like your users can help you determine whether or not things are working <laughs> and whether or not right. you need to update your app or, or push another version. But it's nice to just be able to, from a design perspective, get better and better at knowing what a user um, will respond well to and what they won't respond well to and what works well, what doesn't work well, and so on. I think that's part of, oops, boogers. I think that's part of design. I hit the wrong mouse. I have two mice right here, and I hit the wrong one. Um, but I think that's part of what users just designing for people. It's like you're always like honing in on what that the audience, whatever it is, if it's a user audience or if it's just a poster and it's going to be a reaction to something. And one thing I think is so kind of interesting about what your past has been is designing from typefaces to user interface. You may think, oh, well, you know, those are so different. But really, they both require a lot of intricacy and a lot of attention to detail, and it all has to work within like a path. So it's like you like these games because a, a you know, designing a typeface is is huge, and it's yeah. but it's really this really big kind of problem, as is web design, as is user interface. Do you see those combinations of how you're really attracted to similar things? They're just in a different form. Yeah, there's definitely a pattern besides my curiosity, which is just problem solving. I think, mm -hmm. um, and with typeface design, there's definitely like a problem to be solved, like you'll set up some sort of concept if you're making an original typeface, uh, which I do have some examples of work to show later on. I can show you one that I'm working on, a family that I'm working on, but um, with a typeface project, you'll set up a concept at the beginning of you know, what the parameters are and what the sort of references are and the influences and inspiration, what you're trying to do, and then you just solve that problem. So you're setting up a creative brief the same as you would for an identity project or a web project or a user interface project. They're all sort of like related in that way that you're trying to come up with a, a good, you know, visual solution or creative solution for a problem. So, do you think that, like, if somebody, like, I, if I ask you, what's the thing that gets you excited? Is it that problem solving? Is it that solution kind of driven work? I think so. Um, it's like Paul Rand said, like everything is design, right? So I just kind of approach life that way. That. Um, you know, anything can be influence or inspiration for something that I'm working on or something that I may work on in the future. Just kind of approaching life in an open way, um, I think, is really important. And I also think one other thing that I could tell from your talk at Creative South and your other um, WMC Fest talk was that you do bring that history. And so maybe it's that art history kind of background, that love of um, what's gone on. But then you also really like the current history as well so it's but you like that you and you bring that kind of um, community aspect something that we can relate to or into almost everything you do is that something that really kind of drives you on or is that just a natural kind of progression yeah I mean I think good design is definitely rooted in history um, and like what has worked well there's like a long history right that we can look at uh, things that have worked super well. I guess with the, with the internet, not such a long history, but with print design, there's certainly like a much longer history of solutions that have worked well for things. So just being aware of that and kind of bringing that art history background uh, to bear and then adding to it, supplementing with a bit of design history, I think is super important, especially for young designers, just to, like, to know what came before um, and know what other people have done and which areas you can sort of like push in a little bit differently or like be able to combine things, like the more your influences are varied, I think, um, the bigger pool of like influences and inspiration you're drawing from, the more original your work will be, um, and the more interesting stuff you can come up with, which is good. So I think definitely just being, being rooted in history, but having an awareness of what is going on in the world around you right now is, is important, for sure. I definitely it's, think you bring that in. So what do you think is influencing you right now? if you can talk about it. What's influencing me now? I guess I've been re doing a lot of reading this summer, actually, just reading lots of books. Um, so I would say literature is a, is a big influence right now. I mean, everything from science fiction stuff to war stories 
two biographies, you name it. So do you think that there, I always wonder about this because my dad wanted me to do business as well, but I didn't <laughs> do well in it, so I, he let me drop it. And I made a living, so that's good. Um, but do you ever, do you tend to read books up at all in the business arena? I mean, you run your own business now, so you kind of have to rely on yourself in a lot of other ways that you maybe weren't planning to as a designer. But do you tend to read anything in the business world? Yeah, I guess I do. Um, mostly like design focus. There's a really good book called, I think, The Freelancer's Bible. Mm -hmm. um, by someone over at Freelancers Union, which is a super great book to check out. It's fairly thick, but really, really informative <laughs> about um, just like almost every aspect of running a design business, from right. how to deal with clients to how to handle um, billing and invoices, um, just like all the business stuff. It's basically a, a crash course in all the stuff you don't really get in design school, which is super good. So. I would yeah. definitely check, check that out. The Freelancer's Bible by uh, Freelancer's Union. Super good one. And I guess the other place that I sort of get like business advice is just from other people in the New York design scene. Like There are lots of other freelancers here, so that's really good. <laughs> and uh, most everyone has like, run into a problem that you're facing currently or something, so you can definitely talk to other people and just try to figure out how to get through whatever the, the current challenge is. I think do you think that was something that, at Studio Mates, that was something that allowed you, because you had that kind of interaction and you had a really good community of other designers who were working on their own, um, that allowed you to feel like you could go out and make it on your own? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely seeing other people do it every day <laughs> was, uh, was really beneficial to me, going out on my own, just knowing that it can be done and that it can be done really well. And Studio Mates is full of people who are doing just that. Um, so I would say definitely. Um, and, and I think just being in a co-working space overall was just such a good experience. Um, just to have people across disciplines that are like looking out for each other and you know, helping each other on projects and things like that. Um, but just like a real sense of community I think was uh, like a big part of, of what Studio Mates was for me. So Tressa asks, do you prefer to run your own business versus working for a company, and what's your hardest challenge? Maybe the hardest challenge is just having to deal with everything that's not creative. <laughs> <laughs> so whether it's invoicing or having to handle a bunch of emails or um, writing proposals or all those kinds of things um, that just sort of like take away time from I mean, they're necessary to allow you, you know, to sort of facilitate you doing your creative work, but um, kind of a pain to deal with sometimes, I would say. Um, definitely. So definitely, you know, days where I show up to the studio and may not get to do any actual creative work until like, 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. I'm sure <laughs> other people have been there. You know, you're just answering emails all day or whatever it is. Um, but definitely the business stuff is challenging. So, um, and I'd say another, uh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say another challenging thing besides um, sort of the business side of design is just uh, like managing clients properly, mm -hmm. I would say, and sort of, and managing projects um, because you don't want to finish a bunch of projects around the same time and then have nothing to work on, that kind of thing, like a, a feast right. or famine situation. Right. So you kind of always have to be doing business development the whole time, like no matter what you're working on, you're just like always, you know, n like you're networking, but in the good sense of that word, right. I guess, like the friendly sense of that word, not, um, I don't know, some creepy conference or something. <laughs> um, but so you're always networking and you're always having to do your own business development in a way. Um, one good thing about uh, New York City for me in the last year, and especially coming from Studio Mates and doing my own thing, um, has just been word of mouth referrals from other people. So um, that's super helpful <laughs> if you can have other people kind of doing the marketing for you, whether it's clients or friends or whatever, um, just saying, like, this guy did a really good job or this person did a really great, you know, job for me, was great to work with. Like, that's fantastic. And um, I think in the last year I have realized that I really enjoy running my own company versus working for someone else. I've definitely been on both sides. And there's just more freedom 
I mean, and running your own thing for sure. So, so Tressa now asks about: Have you found a good life, work, or work life balance? Um, <laughs> sort of still working on that. I mean, there are <laughs> definitely there are definitely good days and bad days. Um, in terms of being in the studio way too long versus you know getting out and hanging out with friends or you know going to art museums or seeing movies or going on trips and that kind of thing. Um, I definitely try to take frequent breaks throughout the workday, no matter what, though. Um, I do, like, solo lunches quite a bit, where I just go grab lunch and read a book, you know, for an hour or something. Uh, if I'm stuck on a project and I go out and, you know, just walk around the neighborhood or take a train to another neighborhood, you know, grab lunch in a different area, whatever the case is. Um, but just trying to find healthy ways to break up the workday, I think, is, is important to a good life-work balance, for sure. And it's, it's a work in progress. It's something I'm working on. I mean, as someone who's sort of new to running a studio, and uh, I just started my second year, I think September 1st was officially one year of business. So yay, I made it in New York for one year. <laughs> um, but I think definitely um, the balance is an ongoing thing, for sure. There are long days since I just started, super long days sometimes. Um, trying to do the business development stuff and also crank out projects and like, get established. Um, but I'm working on it. I'm getting better. <laughs> I think it's there's always, I don't care if you've been in business for 10 years or you've been in business just for one, unless you have other people that you hire, um, there's a lot of stuff that you have to consistently do if you want to continue to be successful. Do you have any plans in the future? Is like your goal to have a you know, five people working with you, or do you want 50 people, or do you just want it to be you? Um, right now, there are no plans to expand the studio, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed to it in the future. Right. Uh, and my experience definitely comes from working in small teams, and I'm mm. a huge fan of small teams. Um, 50 people sounds so <laughs> scary. I'm just not good at all. I think you just you sort of like lose that sense of community. In some ways, if things get a little too big, like there's just so much to handle that isn't um, isn't fun. There's so much logistically to handle that's just not fun when you have such a big team. Um, so I would be definitely excited about having a small team of very like-minded people. Um, in the interim, I'm more interested in the, in this next year of business and doing more collaborations with other creative people, and even outside of design. I'm working on a collaboration with a furniture designer right now in New York. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a little foray into furniture design now, among other <laughs> insane things. Just showing a little bit of everything, but uh, I definitely want to focus more on collaborations in my second year of business than I did in the first year, um, and 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 of course expanding to other areas of creativity besides just collaborating with other designers. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's cool. That's good. I think it's good. Um, I mean, being in New York, you kind of have, I mean, there's tons to do, but you also have a lot of people who have similar um, goals and, and focus, and you have maybe more people than I would have in Mobile, Alabama. But um, what do you think has been some of the... Mm -hmm the things that have, if somebody was trying to replicate this in another city, what would you tell them to do to help them have a successful first year? Oh, good question. Hmm. It wasn't on the list, I'm sorry. I would say, um, so I talked a little bit about how a co-working space, uh, Studio Mace is really good for me. Uh, I would say get involved with some sort of community of other people. Like It's really hard to do it on your own. No one really can. Like you have to collaborate with clients. You have to collaborate with other people, no matter what. Um, and definitely being surrounded by like-minded people who you can just tap on the shoulder, and uh, you know, have a look at your work and give feedback. You know, people you trust that have really good taste or are really good at what they do is what you want. And then you can also return the favor by being like a hovering art director for them, right? You tap them on the shoulder and kind of um, give a little bit back. But I think. That is super helpful, and just trying to do like um, non-creepy networking is also good. <laughs> <laughs> we need a new word for that. Yeah, I don't know. Networking just has such dirty connotations now. I feel like. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I'd say those two things, and then also just 
being very budget conscious in your first year is, is a big deal. Um, so I definitely, <laughs> go ahead. Do you think you had to like really work at um, maybe not overbooking yourself or did you just overbook yourself and then you had to, there was that kind of work-life balance problem, but I feel like you have to believe in yourself that, hey, somebody, for me, it's like, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. You know, <laughs> kind of like believing in yourself. Because in New York, it's hard. It's harder there. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 hard here, but mostly in good ways, I think. Mm -hmm. um, just like everyone's pushing so hard to do better and better and better um, and try new stuff, and that's really good because you have some of the you know top creative people in the world here. So just being around that is is really good and and motivating, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh all right, well, let's talk about your illustration because I think your illustrations are great. And um, if you want me to bring something up on screen, we can start on that too. I know we have, there is some user interface uh, or looks like some stuff with the ballet that you did. So I definitely want to pull up some of this stuff. But let's talk about your illustrations. And if you sent me something that you want me to pull up, just tell me and I'll plop it up. Um, but you have this fantastic ability to communicate through your illustrations. How do you keep from not overworking? And this is kind of exactly like what I'm asking with how do you not overbook your your life with clients? How do you not overwork? Because um, you have so much great information in in um, an illustration. I'm just going to pull up um, the. It's one of. It, hang on, here's one in the middle. So like something like this, it communicates your limited palette, but it's really fun. And how do you not overwork this? And then you can also talk about how you maybe don't overwork a um, your calendar. <laughs> right. So I think with both, it's just like a process of reduction. Mm -hmm. Right. So with illustration, um, taking a look at this one, this is an illustration that I did for Working Not Working, which is uh, sort of a, a network of real-time uh, freelancers and their availability that's then broadcast out to employers or agencies, people looking to hire. Um, so they launched a job board, and this was one of the last projects I worked on at Oak. Um, I did a bunch of illustrations for their job board for different mm -hmm. job perks. So I think this particular job perk was um, maybe like stock options or a 401k. It's like a vintage stock ticker kind of thing. Right. And then and there I was... Think, yep, here's another one. I think this one was... So working at working is a kind of... Uh, it's run by a couple of dudes with great senses of humor. So uh, some of the illustrations are kind of funny, and I think this one was uh, that the office was not a sweatshop or something like that. <laughs> so how do you not, do you just, do you ever overwork it and then you just end up deleting parts? Or do you, I'm going to get to the other one. Do you end up um, yeah, never overworking something? Yeah, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, I think you definitely. I definitely overwork things and then have to scale it back. So it's that just a process of reduction. Like I said, just until um, you know you can remove all the unnecessary elements, and what's left is like everything you need that's essential to communicate whatever the the idea is. It's sort of the same thing with identity design, right? Like you just try to remove all the unnecessary stuff to communicate what you're trying to communicate. For me, I end up designing something. And I can't do it that same day. I don't have enough um, distance from it. Sometimes it takes like two weeks for me to be able to see, especially with an identity. I mean, with that, I kind of have enough time. But with illustration, that's not one of my, um, that's something I'm working on as a skill. So would you, do you have any tips for people who tend to, do you take a walk? Do you go somewhere? Do you, what do you do to kind of step back and be able to look at something? and see what needs to come out. I mean, can you do that really quick now? Yeah, I mean, I think your eye develops over time. And there might be one more image from uh, from this set that has, like, all of the... Yeah. Yeah, this is sort of all of them that we can look at. So this is sort of the full set of job perks that I illustrated for working, not working. Um, yeah, there we are. There's a nice close-up. Oops, boogers. <laughs> Sorry. No I'm going to kind of zoom around so that people can see a little bit better. Hopefully. There we go. But they're really nice. 
Yeah, I guess with each one, uh, just trying to find the balance and like communicate an idea very quickly is uh, is what I was going for with them. I think just I think you to... do you do that really well in all of your uh, illustrations, not just this set, but all of them that I've seen. Thanks. Thanks. That's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think? Um, what have you done in this past year? I'm going to change tunes a little bit for a minute. What have you done in this past year since you've been on your own um, to improve your knowledge of running a business, um, especially like the stuff that you don't like, the invoicing? I don't know anybody that likes that unless they're an accountant or something. <laughs> yeah, so I think that just gets back to a, a couple of things I mentioned earlier, just reading books like the, the Freelancer's Bible or reading articles online and then the, the, the main thing is just getting the real world experience of talking to other people who have already done it. Like that's definitely going to be your most helpful thing, I think. Do you? Uh, it's, it's just finding other successful freelancers. And it doesn't even have to be designers. So it could be people freelancing in other industries, but um, just people who have done it. And then just find like a good accountant and a good lawyer and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Right. <laughs> Do you have a mentor that you use or a few people that you meet with, like a a group that is people from different um, industries that you can, maybe they're still creative industries, maybe not, but that you can kind of talk to about different ideas business-wise? Yeah, so um, there are a couple of things. I'm on a couple of private Facebook groups mm -hmm. uh, with other creative people, and we sort of just like share problems that are happening or questions that we have, and that's been a really good support system. Um, also just like hanging out with people like we're doing now on Google Hangouts or uh, sending chat messages and things like that with other people during the day um, has been super helpful. And then there are bunches of meetups in New York City for creative people as well um, where there might be a speaker or there might be some sort of event, but it's definitely like other creative people that you can talk to and, and hang out with and ask questions. So kind of all of those things. Gotcha. Well, so... I'm going to pull up some more work, and then while we're looking at the work, if you can tell us a little bit about it, and then maybe also talk about what you do when you hit a creative block. And I'm sorry I keep forgetting to get it off of you. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm just going to go. I, I guess this is your your um, a card that you've designed, and then it has a fade on the side. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is for Studio 55. Let me switch my screen over. All right, so uh, Studio 55 is a creative firm in New York City that produces interesting content mm -hmm. um, sort of across different industries. And I designed their identity, and then these were their business cards, which were really fun. So um, they sort of work with bold, cutting-edge cards, and they wanted like some really bold, kind of crazy cards. Um, and, and so these are the colors that we ended up going with for the overall branding, like a neon green and an electric blue. Mm-hmm. Um, but I got to do this, you know, super fun gradient edge painting on these cards and get them, uh, you know, pr actually produced, which was really fun. That's cool. All right, so... Yeah, I'm so... Go... Yeah, just whatever other... Stu yeah, here's another Studio 55 thing. So they do media planning and digital strategy. They curate events. They help with fundraising. Um, and they work with models and art galleries and photographers and artists, uh, et cetera, in sort of a, a variety of ways. Uh, so I designed their identity first, and then I also designed and developed their website. So mm -hmm. I think we're just looking at the mobile version of the site first. And oh, then yeah. I think I'm going backwards. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we can sort of see the, the home, this is the home page, I think, that we're looking at now. Um, and then the page that Diane was showing just before that was sort of the, um, the view of one of their clients. So this is Pioneer Works, who is uh, an art space and a gallery space. Um, I, I, and I think also a workspace for creative people that is located in Red Hook, Brooklyn. So you can sort of navigate using those buttons at the bottom to you know, sort of the next client. Um, cool. And then, of course, there's the mobile version of the site was the next thing. I think so. I also design and develop responsive versions of the site, so you can check that out for yourself at uh, studio55nyc.com. And are you doing all this coding yourself? Yes. 
wow, do you like that stuff? Uh, I actually do. That's <laughs> great. Enough. Yeah. I mean, I was probably like a lot of designers coming from the world of print, just like terrified of writing code for a while. But it was silly. I shouldn't have been. And it's actually, it's pretty fun. <laughs> I think I think once you can understand, it's just another language. Once you get it, it makes sense. But there is that learning curve. How long, how much time did you spend really studying so that you felt like you got it? So I kind of did the opposite thing. Rather than um, starting with studying until I felt like I was ready to do it, I just like, took projects and then figured it out. Um, sort of being forced into it was the best thing. I forced myself to do it, and that was uh, really, really crucial to getting started. And, and just, they weren't for... Go ahead. It wasn't for a nonprofit. It was for a yeah. paying client. Oh, yeah, real, real clients. So <laughs> real, real, real stuff at stake, for sure. Um, but I just like had a, a, tr a belief in myself that I could do it, and I would just figure out what I needed to figure out to get the projects done. Um, so yeah, that was a, a big part of my first year of business, I'd say. It was um, writing code pretty much every day and just getting better and better at it. Breaking a lot of things and then fixing them. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, the that's, a, that's what writing code is all about. You figure out what there's another way to do it. And it's also about being a really good researcher and networking, because not creepy networking, but the other one that we're going to make <laughs> a new word for. Um, Sorry, I keep forgetting to flip back. Um, so Jason also asked, um, how do you feel about developing versus designing? I mean, they're kind of the same thing, really, in a lot of ways. Um, just you're using code to solve a problem versus you know, other visual methods that you might use in um, more traditional like print-based graphic design. But I just see like code is just another tool to solve a problem, really. Right. All right, so let's look at um, one more piece because I know we're about out of time and I know you got things to do. I think I've started at the first one, so I hope. Um, yeah, maybe we can get through several of them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this looks like the first image. So I worked um, in my first year with Isabella Boylston, who is a professional ballerina with the American Ballet Theater. And this was a super fun project because I got to do art direction. So the photo you're looking at there is uh, from an actual photo shoot that I art directed, which was super fun. And uh, for each one of the images, I sort of went in and retouched them. And if you move to the next, I think, image, Oops. yes. So there are several um, images that I art directed like this, where I sort of retouched the image and then put in these really flowy, um, flowing backgrounds, these kind of soft shapes that really accentuate like how rigid and firm her, her lines and her angles are. Yeah. Um, but it was just a really good opportunity to keep the homepage super centered and focused on, on Isabella and what she does. She's so, so talented. Um, so yeah, that was art direction, web design, web development, who's sort of the responsive version of the site. Um, and you can see more at IsabellaBoylston.com. All right, so then um, you want to talk about your typeface? Sure. Oh, neighbor. Yeah, so this is the typeface that I started working on uh, at the Cooper Union whenever I was in the Cooper Type program. And it's my first big, like, original typeface family. It's a rounded, squarish sans serif, if that makes sense. <laughs> so all the edges are rounded, but it's built on this, like, squarish skeleton. And sort of the, the concept behind it, or the design challenge I was trying to solve with this uh, particular design is building something on a squarish skeleton that didn't feel too boxy mm -hmm. or, um, like, too digital or, like, Techie, like right. a lot of typefaces built on a square skeleton have that kind of like rigid techie feel to them. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something that was squarish, but sort of maintained like this gently rounded circular shape at the same time on all four sides. Um, so yeah, that's what this design is all about: is making something really friendly and usable. Yeah, a couple more close-ups on some clips here. And it's a big, um, so it's a big family. I mean, yeah, I, th I think it's up to maybe six styles now, um, and the images we're looking at now are not like recent ones. I've got some more recent stuff, but uh, those I just didn't have those like ready to go. So this is actually from a specimen that I made during the Cooper Type program. Um, so, but it's super fun, right? Like, look how look at that lowercase g. It's really fun, right? 
I love the um, really light lowercase g um, where on uh, neighbors I I or neighborinos. I think that g is so friendly and fun. Like I just really like that lowercase g. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, so I think it is a challenge to design a face. Um, you have a lot of weights with it in the family, but then it really is, it's not super techy, it's really friendly, and I like how you describe the rounded square, so I think that's pretty good. So, Alonzo, I want to make sure everybody knows um, ways to get in touch with you, and I'm going to plop back over to you real quick and see if I can sure. go down to a smaller screen and see if I've missed any images. Uh, oh, there's one other one. Um, this piece, uh, a packaging uh, piece, which again has lots of parts and packaging is so similar to all these really detailed things. Do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so this is uh, a set of packaging that I designed last year for Quarterly Co. And Quarterly is an e-commerce company that sort of curates packages from tastemakers every, uh, every quarter of the year, so every three months. You get a package in the mail, and you can subscribe to people like GQ Magazine and Pharrell, um, Bill Nye the Science Guy, Ariana Huffington. They um, sort of have some really great uh, uh, tastemakers and well-known people that you can subscribe to, and then they'll send you a package. So the idea behind the packaging is the contributor writes a letter describing sort of what's in the package and what the concept was every time. Um, and I designed this nice little, um, you can see the sort of blue folder with the diagonal cut which mm -hmm. shows the contributor's face like right away so you kind of have that instant connection as soon as you open the package. And then there's a, you know, a pattern designed um, sort of based on like the history of the postal service and that kind of thing uh, for the inside of the boxes. And some of this stuff actually got produced and is, is being used right now for quarterly code, which is really cool. That is cool. That's awesome. Well, Alonzo, you're super talented and you do so many, your brain is so busy. I don't know how you're able to um, sleep at night, I guess, but I'm glad. I'm glad that you are. I'm glad you've been. You've made it through your first year on your own. It can feel like a long time, but I, I hope that you're really proud of yourself, and I hope that you keep going. And I wish you all the luck. But I want to share some ways that people can um, follow you and get in touch. And there was a couple other links that you wanted me to share, so I'm going to share those real quick. Um, Dart arrows, if I can get the right. Um, you want to tell us what that is? I'm going to put that over here in the chat. Sure. I think there might be an image or two um, that you could show, which would, would probably help. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Let's see if I can get to it. Let's so see. Dart Arrows was a recent side project of mine, and it is a set of 100 vector arrows. Oh, that must be the one that didn't go through. Through gotcha. so. Yeah, that one's a. I think that was a GIF, and that's just like the last frame of it of the animated GIF. Maybe right. there's one more. Is there one more image of of those there, dart arrows? There might be. The only other thing that's left is Ashley. Somebody, Ashley Graham. Yeah, yeah. This is identity um, branding for a fashion model here in New York City. Okay, so just check out dartarrows.com then, and you'll see. Um, just a really fun side project. So I did a hundred, a set of 100 vector arrows that designers can use to sort of embellish illustrations or typeface designs or posters or whatever. Um, and it was based on a set of vintage playing darts. At least the original inspiration was a set of vintage playing darts that I found at a flea market in uh, Brimfield, Massachusetts. So this was fun because I got to sort of do everything. I came up with the concept for it. I illustrated all 100 of the arrows. Um, you know designed and developed the website, et cetera. But yeah, just a super fun little side project, so check it out. Did you keep a side project going so that you, when you weren't busy, you would have something to do? Or did you keep it just to keep you your mind sane with all the other stuff that was going on? Um, I guess I have a bunch of ongoing like side projects in the background. I mean, there's probably no less than 20 like side projects I'm working on at any given time, just in various states. <laughs> I just, right. You know, I just finally I pushed out dart arrows. I actually started working on them last fall. I drew 50 arrows, and that was going to be like the full set. But then I picked it up like a month ago and looked at the design and was like, hey, I think this needs 50 more. 
so I did another 50. Um, but I just need to get better at like at pushing outside projects. So I gave myself like two weeks to push this, you know, draw the other 50 arrows, design and develop the site, and just push it out. Um, and hopefully, going forward in my second year, I can just get better about like knocking more of the side projects off my list and and pushing them out. But you must have to be really good at planning your time if you're able to put some time into these side projects instead of just overbooking your calendar. Or um, I think those side projects feed into new projects that you're interested in, and clients see those things, and then you get other work from it. So it's yeah. important. Yeah, I mean, side projects are definitely, I mean, there have been so many design talks in recent years that focus on those, I think, and articles written, but um, they're just really great because you have full creative control, usually, over a side project. You can also collaborate with other people on them, and it just maybe gives you an opportunity to explore something outside whatever your main work is normally, and just kind of show new skills or learn new skills, um, but it's like just really healthy and I think crucial to like not go crazy. Um, right. In a design practice, so, yeah, side projects, love them, do them. <laughs> yeah, but you just gotta stay committed. And if you can't commit, maybe a lot of time, then just do what you did. Give it two weeks, and then have a goal and just crunch it down. Yep. All right. Well, Alonzo, you everybody, you can follow him at alonzofelix.com. Alonzo, thank you so much for coming on today. It was a great uh, interview. I'm excited to learn more, and I'm excited that you keep learning more yourself. And it's a, it's encouraging to know that you like the um, development stuff. It is a big plan, so I really definitely like that. And you just shared over there um, where people can follow you on Insta Instagram and on Twitter. And then if you guys um, follow me as well, Instagram um, as des at Design Recharge, and then I'm on Twitter in at Design Recharge and at Diane Gibbs AU. And then if you never want to miss an episode, you can always, um, let me see if I can get this link, and then you guys can sign up. And we are taking the week off next week. I hope I got it Ooh, up there. that sounds good. Yes, I, 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 this is my side project, and I am excited to have a week off, and then we'll be back on um, in uh, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. So um, I will be promoting that stuff later. I'm taking the week off, though. So, Alonzo, thanks so much for being my um, first one before my vacation, I guess. Right. And just thank you. You are great. Thanks for the inspiration, and thanks for bringing something different into design so that we can remember to go outside of our little design bubbles. <laughs> thanks, Diane. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'll see you in two weeks.